who's the Dalai Lama's biographer right now. His name is Kuo Ron Tundu Naki. Uh, he's like very old now, and he taught me those tricks, and those tricks are unbelievable. If you learn those tricks in the other video, you can pronounce Tibetan perfectly, which is difficult, okay? And it's just in a couple of hours. Um, and now Sanskrit, uh, sorry, Tibetan grammar, uh, you can learn that in uh, like a day or two. It's very, very simple. If you do know it, then you can almost read anything. Then it's just a matter of vocabulary, right? It's just picking up vocabulary. If you don't know it, uh, then somehow you've got this wall between you and the scriptures. You always have this problem. You know, you have to get over the grammar, the very few grammar rules there are, you must know before you attack the task of learning to that, to try to learn the scriptures. You have to. This thing is a key, okay? This thing is like a wishing tree. And that's why he made it that. You know, this is in the lab as well. You know, I want to read those incredible Tibetan books. Okay, just rub this lamp. You know? And that's why it was called the Rishi Tree. Uh, the Lord of Rishi Tree. So it's like a key. Um, Ken Rinpoche uh, used to require that we uh, memorize this before he would teach us to learn. You know, we, I had to memorize this particular chapter uh, before Rinpoche would teach us to learn. So I encourage you to try to memorize it. It's a good first text to learn to memorize. It's not only important for your study, it's just an interesting text to memorize and it's easy. Okay? And for years, nobody taught me to memorize properly. I sat on my bed uh, in Hell, New Jersey and tried to memorize the Al-Mirana and nobody taught me. Then I came here to the monastery and I saw this Geshe, uh, this great Geshe, and he was uh, upstairs at the temple. And he was in a courtyard about like this. It was about, I don't know, what is this, like 40 feet across or something, you know? And, and he would uh, take the book and look at it, and then he'd put it behind his back, and then he would walk from wall to wall, and he looked like a swimmer, you know? A swimmer comes to the wall and flips over and goes across. And just before he hit the wall, he'd turn around and go to the other wall. And the point is to walk while you memorize it. It's a, it's a great thing. Nobody told me for years. And then when I started doing it, it's great. Okay? And you take this text, uh, the root text, right, not the commentary. And, which is in verse, so there's a rhythm and a beat to it. And you just, you just pick a time during the day, you say, I'm going to memorize for 15 minutes a day, it's fine. 20 minutes a day, it's fine. You know, on top of my hours of meditation, on top of my half hour, um, I'm going to memorize for 15 minutes a day. And just do as much as you can. And make it a lifetime habit. And you just go from there, walk from there, and, and read this thing out loud. It should be loud, okay? When you memorize, it should be uh, almost like half shouting. It's like, it, it sinks it into your brain. It's, it's really incredible. Then when you memorize scriptures, you're actually <coughs> memorizing what Maitreya said and what Buddha said. And it, it gets into your subconscious. It affects you deeply. So anyway, just go from wall to wall and, and say it loudly. Like when I was in Arizona on a tree, I would just uh, walk in a huge circle around the pasture or something. And, and then it's a good exercise and it gives you fresh air and you're yelling. And, uh, it's nice. And then all this stuff piles up in your brain. You'll forget the third thing you memorized after you did the fifth thing. And that's okay. It has its effect on you. Okay. Uh, so do that. Also, don't get proud about memorizing. Don't become a memorizing uh, monster that goes around and brags about how much they've memorized. You know, just memorize it. Use it for yourself. Uh, you know, I think it's important not to brag about it. I think it actually hurts your memorization if you like try to make a big deal about it for other people. But when you need something, it's there. You know, when you're in retreat and you don't have the book, it's right there in your mind and you just, you just check it and you, you keep going. Okay? So it's, it's a good text to start your memorization. Mm, I want to tell you a little bit about it. So, so anyway, that's why it's called a wishing tree. You will get what you want. In other words, you'll be able to open those two or three hundred thousand incredible Tibetan books. You can't imagine what they're like. You, know, you imagine the most amazing science fiction book you ever read or Socrates, or the Bible, or Dante, or Shakespeare. Every one of those books is like that. You know, like, I really appreciate Shakespeare. I, I love to read Dante once in a while. I love a good science fiction book in the bathroom once a day. Um, but, uh, but these things are all like the most in, in, incredible book you've ever read. And if you could just crack it, you know, if you could just open it up, uh, you'd, you'd just freak out. You'd never stop. You'd become one of those people who just, you know, goes around the world trying to find more of them. You know what I mean? So they're just amazing. Everyone is amazing. Every single one is true. And, and they make your life turn into a, a 
science fiction stuff. <laughs> so, so it's an appropriate, it's appropriate name, Okay. All right. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, first about the author.
Say Sumchipa. 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 Sumchipa means 30. Sum means 3. Ji means 10. Sumchipa means the 30. And there's a bit of a debate about what the 30 are. If you take his, one of his existing uh, famous books, and if you strip out all like the introductory material and all the conclusion, concluding material, it comes out to 30 verses. And, and that's probably what Sumchipa means. It probably means the 30 verses, like Ye the 8,000 verses, or Sum Yapa, the 300 verses, which is a, another name for the diamond cutter, okay, which is really only 300 lines. Okay. Uh, this is called the 30. Some uh, later scholars have said, since its uh, subject matter deals with Tibetan language, and since there are 30 consonants in Tibetan, he called it the 30. But most people think this is the 30 verses. Okay. Uh, erase everything from here. We're taking a picture of each thing you write on the board to okay. add to the notes. Okay. We thought they might be writing something under that. Thanks. <laughs> 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 he also wrote another book called the Tanju. Okay. <laughs> Okay. And he 
journey back to them is S O V. I to the story. That's all. Okay. I mean that to that Sit that spoils the other that, okay? Uh, I to the store away. You know, uh, if you want to learn to speak, you get to meet me like a Tibetan, you just change it up. You know, like, you can would often get up and say, this book wrote Joseph Hopper. You know, something like that, you know? And, uh, you know, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anyway. <laughs> and we have here uh, Yang Chen Dupe Dorges, uh, Root Tech, which is very short, so it's easy to memorize. It's a page and a half. Okay, we're talking pages one and two here. Okay. Uh, and then we have Yang Chen Ruby Dorje's own commentary to his, to his root text. So it's cool. It's often very preferable when you have something like Lord Atisha wrote uh, Land to the Path and then he wrote his own commentary. So it's very nice when somebody writes an auto commentary. So here we have not only the commentary, but uh, not only the original, but also the, uh, his own commentary. Mm -hmm. And they're both by I'm going to, you should follow on page one, okay? Uh, and we'll just go, we'll just start right here. You know, instead of giving just a class on uh, grammar and, and sort of designing it myself, this has been planned on the spur of the moment, uh, I thought I'd like to just go through the text straight, okay? And then uh, you'll know what it means. And, and if I uh, remember something that is not covered, that would be pertinent to a Westerner, you know, like there's some things here that they don't mention because Tibetans are learning it. Uh, I'll throw it in because there are, there are some tricks that if you know them, you make your life easier. Okay, okay here we go. Uh, I'm going to read the first two lines. Tumi Lashay Sumchuk and Mungo, Jimmy Wamo Shuso. Tumi means Tumi Sambor. Tumi Lashay means that great book, that well spoken book, that eloquent book by Tumi Sambor called Sumchuk, okay, the 30. Ningbo means the essence. Jimbe Wangbo means, uh, you know, Lord of all great trees. Shipso is hearing contained. So hearing contained is the Lord of all great trees, which is the essence of the 30 verses, which is an eloquent uh, writing by Tumu Okay, something like that. And sometimes you'll see this book called Lekshin uh, Jumwa. It's, it's other names, Lekshin Jumwa, meaning uh, the great tree of, of eloquence. And the eloquence being Tumu Sambo's original work written 12th century before, okay? And then uh, the, the tree being the commentary upon it, this text by, by Yang Chen Dupe Dorje. Wu Chu, Yang Chen Dupe Dorje. Okay, here we go. And I'm not gonna go into great detail. I'm gonna try to make it so that you get what you need to translate a text. You know? I mean, my idea of this is, I don't, I don't want it to become, I haven't taught this at all. Uh, I don't want it to become a subject, you know what I mean? Like, uh, there are many stories of great British pundits in Tibet who got derailed by grammar or Sanskrit or some other computers. Okay? Uh, you know, computers to be used for something. But they get off into programming and off into, you know, or, or even video. You know, if it becomes a thing, uh, you, you, you lose the message in the medium. You see, I mean, to me, all I want you to do is learn the, the guts that you have to know to, to translate something and to read something. You know, I, I, I hope uh, that this, this is considered a minor science in Japan. Uh, the knowledge of grammar, studying language, is, is something you do if, if you finish your geshe, you finish your tantric studies, you reach the enlightenment, then you want to go back and do architecture or uh, grammar or something like that. That's okay. So uh, what I mean is, don't let it become the goal. It's a means to your goal. Okay, so I'm not going to try to make you uh, great Tibetan classical grammarians. That's not my goal. I want you, after two or three hours of you know, stuffing, uh, to be able to crack a Tibetan book. That's it. And then, then throw the ship out, right? I mean, when the ship reaches the other shore, let the ship go. Okay? Don't, you know, don't sit there for the rest of your life and, and study Sanskrit grammar, Tibetan grammar, when you could study, uh, you know, Chinese. Uh, Mind only some sexy thing like that. Okay. Uh, here we go. Namo Guru Man Manju Gokaya in the in the Tibetan. Okay. Namo Guru means I bow down to my Nama means uh, name. It came to me, I bow down. Namas means I bow down. Namaste means I bow down to you. Uh, Namaskar, Namaste, Mari Hindi means uh, hello, how, hi. Okay. When, uh, when us bumps into the guru, it becomes oh, so namo. 
Guru, Guru means my Guru. Uh, Manju Kosha means uh, Manjushmi. You can either say Manjushmi or Manju Kosha, same thing. Uh, Jambaya or uh, Jambaya, uh, same thing. Jambaya, same thing. So I bow down to my Lama, who is Manjushmi. Okay, and here you got to know a trick that, uh, for example, Tumi Samboda is, is believed to have been uh, another emanation of Manjushri. And Tumi Samboda himself is believed to have been another uh, emanation of Manjushri. Where's another emanation of Manjushri you've ever seen? Sanjay. Sabuti, right? I think it was Sabuti, you know? By the way, I don't know if somebody wants to go out and ask her if they can leave the bedroom to I don't know what it is exactly. Okay. Goshaya in Sanskrit is to that person I got him. Uh, then it says, Lama Chota Yerne the Jampa Yamla, Gupin Ne. Okay, uh, I bow down with great respect to my Lama, who is indivisible from my Jushu. Okay? And that's what the first. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole lines, I just, you can figure it out later after you learn syntax. Uh, to me, Naisha is Sun Tupe, Nungo Doru Shepard Cha. Having bowed down to my brother, uh, who is my Jushu, I can't, half the time I think he's my Jushu, half the time I think he's a normal guy, I can't tell. To me, Naisha is Sun Tupe, Nungo Doru Shepard Cha. I will give you an explanation of the 30 verses, of the essence of the 30 verses, in, in brief. Okay, I'm not going to. Do it very long, which is a which is a which is a work of great eloquence written by Tumi Samba. Okay? Then he gets into the point of the book. Okay? Uh, by the way, if you can't follow the Tibet, don't worry. I just want to get it on tape. You've got three years to work it out. Yang Jawa Sepo or Chepa. This is one of those cases where you have to read across the line divisions. Okay? I'll say it again. Yang Jawa Sepo or Chepa. These are the vowels of the Tibetan language. Uh, they serve to give to give syllables their life. We call them the life of syllables. Like just K is <laughs> see, just P is <laughs> and and uh, and the vowels give them life. The vowels uh, give them clarity. Okay, so instead of saying we say ka, instead of saying we say ba, and that's the function of a vowel. And then he gives four vowels. Uh, E U A O. Say E U E U A O. These are the, the basic yarns. Okay. Notice that this is the same word for harmony or song that we saw in Yang Chen Yang's own name, and also in uh, the, the name of Saraswati, the goddess of song, dance, uh, all kinds of melody, language. Study language. So this is the word for the for vowels. There are, he lists four vowels here. E U A O. Uh, he has put them in alphabetical order. Anyway, that's a basic awesome. All, 
All consonants have their own innate vowel sound R. And these are the four written vowels. Okay. This one, this one, this one, this one. These are called Diku, Shakyu, Dengu, Naru. Okay, we went to over that in the pronunciation class. If you don't know about it, go get that tape. Okay. Okay. Um, Ian, yeah. yeah. check with us. Just look over here before you erase it. See if we're taking a photo of it. Consonants cannot serve as suffix. So 
Then when you make a transcription system, it must be airtight. Every single unique symbol must be, must be represented with a different symbol or, or combination of symbols. And people just don't get it. You know, uh, look at the cover of the book we're studying this afternoon. You know, my guys have mixed it. I'm talking the, the book that's being studied with Michelle Scott. Okay. Oh, yeah. In Jetson Coppola's name, the first one is RJD, which is the technical transcription. Mm -hmm. The second, uh, the next one is uh, simplified pronunciation, it's home. The third one is back to transcription, ha. Uh, the fourth one is back to simplified pronunciation, ha. Uh, <laughs> the fifth one is mixed up to so, because they haven't done yet, and thrown in a B. Love song instead of love song. Okay? And then uh, Dhaka is just a Hindi pronunciation of Dhaka. <laughs> uh, you see that up to the great scholars of Tibet, I mean, don't miss what it sounds like to how you transcribe it. Okay? Um, so that's good. Okay. Now, an example of this, this is a primary suffix letter. The K sound is a primary suffix letter. We call it Gen Z. Okay? Now, Sometimes you'll have another subject there. By the way, this is just a terminator, this, this symbol is what you're getting to. You add a secondary suffix letter, su, and that's called a young G. There are only two possible secondary suffix letters in the Tibetan language. I'll give you an example. Uh, well, well there's, they are su and ha. There's only two. They are never pronounced, okay? Except in Ladakh or my Oh, uh, they might say Rix. Okay? Probably that's the original pronunciation. Probably they are correct, okay? The way they pronounce it out in the outlying lands, while the syllabus, you know, the center changes quickly and it starts to slur over the centuries. The outlying lands like the Dak and Mongolia, they're still pronouncing it Rix, okay? which is probably correct. Okay. So, that's a good thing. Now, you should know that this secondary suffix letter, da, is never written anymore. Okay? If you find an old book, an ancient book, like, I don't know, maybe over a thousand years old, you might find them written there. Uh, they are not written in the modern language. Okay? Their effects on the sound of the letter or their effects on what comes after them are still there. So we know that they are there, uh, but they don't occur anymore in the written language. So uh, you, might, you might, if you read some very old books, you might see that as a secondary subject. Now these can only come after other letters, and I'm not going to get into it here. Um, let me see if he does. Yeah, he does. Well, let's do it, and then we'll stop. Okay. This can come after Da is allowed to come after as a secondary suffix after the primary suffix, not a lot of that. Sa is allowed to come out before that. Rikspa might be something that didn't exist. 
because thought is, in a sense, uh, something which is ethereal. You see what I mean? And he was he was playing on the two meanings of, of the two the two meanings of this sound. He stripped off the sa and said pa. Uh, logic riffs is mostly thinking riff. You know, he just read the sound the same. And then he was playing on that meaning. So uh, the secondary suffix has a very important job, very important function to distinguish between two different meanings altogether. How do we do that in English? How do you spell two? Which two? Between harmonies, words that sound the same, we have totally different meanings. You know, like yidak. Yidak might mean pure mind, but if you put a, a saw on it and a wasser on it, it's yidak and it's a prayer. You see what I mean? Then it's a totally different thing. So that uh, it has to be, if you say dopa and it has a secondary saw on it, it means realization. If you say dopa and it doesn't have a secondary saw on it, it means wrong idea. Okay, so you gotta be very careful. That's, that's why we use secondary suffers money. You can lose it, you got anything else to do with it. No, uh, one more thing. Did you get a picture of that? Okay. I just want to give you the prefix letters, and then we'll be able to dive into real grammar. This is stuff you covered already in the, in the other video, in the pronunciation video. How these prefix letters and suffix letters affect the pronunciation. It's a whole art in itself. I'm not going to get into it. You have to go learn it from the video. And the way I taught it on the video, again, is uh, Kumo Maon Tukunaki's unbelievable system. That he's a great linguist who taught Tibetan in China up until 1959. Then he went to Japan and taught linguistics. Then he went to Ann Arbor and got a linguistics degree in uh, English. And he's just an incredible guy. He's amazing. He's about 70 you now. And uh, he taught me that system. You know, he came to Russia and everything. I was 20 years old or something. He says, I said, can you teach me the, any of the incredible knowledge? He was trained in the Padala Palace uh, as a government scholar. <coughs> uh, so he said, teach me something, Kumala. Teach me you know, the history of the kings of Tibet. Or teach me the chronicles of blue animals or something. He says, I, I know what you need, Mike. I said, boy, he says, the alphabet. <laughs> He's like, I mean, people are like, I know the alphabet, I, I'm very good at it. He's like, no, no, your pronunciation sucks, you know, you have to start all over again, you know, you maybe start all over again. And he taught me this incredible system, so you should learn it from the other video. It's a beautiful, beautiful system. If you learn it, your Tibetan is perfect. You pronounce it perfect, and it's no big sweat. It's like, it takes really one or two days. And then, uh, because if you don't learn that, you will forever be doing it wrong. You know, from the beginning, learn to do it right. There's nothing sadder than the foreigners who come to, you know, Darmstadt and start speaking their Tibetan and wow, the girls, the girls. Everybody's trying to be polite. Like the Tibetan wouldn't tell you that you're just saying gibberish. You know, <laughs> you know <laughs> like you're not know pronouncing correctly. Because words can change completely. You know, like uh, like Gami's I like you. Garmin, where is it? Garmin, where's the blasphemy? You know, uh, and if you don't pronounce it right, then you're in trouble. Garmin, so uh, that you can learn from the other video. Last thing, last last thing. Silent 
prefix letters like the K in knife or the K in no. I know it. Okay. Uh, these are silent prefix letters. Again, they serve to uh, change meanings and they also change the sound. Now, how they change the sound, you have to study from the other Google. Um, I just want you to know that these are going to affect what you identify as the mean sheet. You're going to see a pile of three letters. There's not going to be any vowel signs anywhere. And you have to know that these five can qualify as prefix letters. And then you'll be able better to identify which sound you're supposed to start with. Okay. Now this is all not technically much to do with grammar, uh, but he's put it in his text. And that makes a nice introduction to our class. Okay. Uh, we'll continue again, I think on the 26th in the morning. Uh, I suggest, you know, since you don't have any detail then, um, why don't you memorize that? That's at page one. It would be the first uh, four, sorry, first five lines. And again, the way you memorize it, you just somebody, have somebody write out the spells for you. And you just find an empty temple somewhere. <coughs> uh, they use the roofs at night. Uh, you know, it's very beautiful. They just walk back and forth. Be careful not to fall off. And uh, just walk back and forth. You know, you get to see the stars, fresh air, it's dark. And you just keep saying it over and over again until uh, you, you realize that you're not looking at the book anymore. Okay, and that's the way you do it. Okay. Five lines ending where? Sorry? Five lines ending where? Uh, line six. Line six. Okay, second phrase, line six. Can Stop there. Yeah. Could you read the five lines? I'll read the five lines, okay? Uh, I used to memorize the titles just like the other ones, okay? To me, like she said, you may need more. Jimmy Wong will shoot sir. Mamo Guru Manju Ko Kaya. Mama Chota Yemete. Jambe Yamba Kudune. Jimmy Lekshe Sujube. Ningondo Du Shepherdla. That's his promise to compose a text, very famous. Yambi Chawa Sakuru Chepa Ibu Eo Shi. Sajay Kaso Sujuyi. Hana Hana Bama A. Rala Sana Jendu Tu. Dada Sani Yanjute Dani Nara La Sundan Sorry, Dani Nara La Sundan Sani Anabama Po Anabama Arun Juch Okay? Alright, we'll do it here And then uh, we'll continue on the 26th We're going to take one in this class of the series
Have you got power now? No. Um, <laughs> Last time we reached uh, page one. Uh, we reached out to the. Let me see. We were at the. Uh, we just got to the end of the fifth line, and we're starting on the sixth line. Uh, and it says here. Uh, these are some of the lines that you will remember three years later after memorizing it and forgetting it. Como dono bomo o rolo soto rande te. Zok tik da de chik chan chan. Okay. <laughs> these are um, terminative particles. They, they end sentences. As you may have noticed, Tibetan doesn't have uh, formal sentence endings the way we have in English with a period. So when they close a thought, they use uh, something with an O sound on it, with a nato on it. So uh, the possibilities are given here. Como, dono, bomo, o, rolo, so, do. That's like 11 different versions. And the reason there's 11 is that you just match the last letter of the syllable before. So if your sentence ends in ur, you say, like, gyur, you say, gyuro. Okay? Uh, if your sentence ends in, uh, uh, like, en, sun, you say, sun, no. And then no indicates this is the end of the thought. Okay? Um, that's usually the end of a major thought. And it's not applied like periods are in English. So it's not always... Uh, you won't see them that frequently, okay? At the end of a quotation of scripture, at the end of a major thought in a philosophy book, you'll get this, okay? Uh, otherwise, all you'll get is a, is a she, is a, is a Tibetan, uh, is a Tibetan uh, straight line, you know, a vertical line, meaning this is the end of a piece of sentence, okay? Uh, also, those are not complete sentences. So sometimes you may be translating like, a grammar text and the translation may go past three or four of those vertical slashes, which represent phrases of thought. And then sometimes you may get a sentence like from Jetson Kappa that, that you have to cut three sentences out of one slash. Okay? That's the way different authors are. Okay, so the slash, there's no like very clear uh, ending to a sentence. Uh, these are major ending terminative problems. Okay? Uh, the ones that might interest you, well, we'll talk about it later. Um, they say lardu. These, these are called lardu. Gather together, lard is to again. Okay, so it just means to wrap something up. Lard means these are wrapping up particles. Uh, these are also called dadu. Same thing, okay? It just means wrapping up particle. Now there's a difficult part in the text here that I thought uh, might crack for you. Uh, go back to page one. It says, uh, what does it say there? Uh, it just says, Dadu Ken Che Jami. They're also called Dadus, okay? Yeah, we're on the sixth line from the top, page one. It says, Zotsi Dadu Che Jami. And the uh, commentary says, uh, they're called Dadu in a book called Mago Tsunja. Mago Tsunja means something like uh, the, the weapon for opening the door to syntax or something. And it was <laughs> written in the 11th century by somebody named Smriti Zinyana. And in there he calls it Dadu. So the, the root text by uh, Muchu, Nyachen Dukidoje, says uh, it's also called a Dadu, it's also called a Lardu. Okay? Or you could call it a zoxi, okay? And let's see the zoxi.
Say don't take. Don't take. Uh, don't means to finish something, okay? Complete something. Like don't grim is the completion stage of time. Sig means a word. So don't sig means a terminated protocol. Okay? So these are all called Marmadus or Dadu or Zotik. Okay? Now, how are they joined onto other words? The text says uh Tola, Kameo, Shenam, Minte, Jetunja. I'm gonna talk about the Shenam Minte Jetunja. Shenam Minte Jetun Jarak means, with a couple of exceptions, these just follow the last letter of the syllable that came at the end of the sentence, okay? So that's all. You say Gyuro, Tenno, okay, like that. What are the exceptions? I'm going to draw them for you. There's a thing called a Da Ta. And by the way, you don't have to get all this today. It's just on, to get it on tape, and then you look at it, and you decide you finally got to learn it today. Okay? <laughs> Say, da-da. Da, da. da, da. da means uh, a, a suffix letter, da. And in this case, it happens to be a secondary suffix letter, da. Okay? Second suffix letter, da. Chak means a hard one. Okay? Like, chakbo means uh, like a fierce deity. Okay? So, da-da means uh, a hard D sound. Now, where do you get a hard D sound? Uh, is is at the end of a of a word like chin that has one of those missing da's. Okay, so hard d is a code word for a secondary da that drops out of the language later. You'll never see it spelled like that. It'll always be chin, and it, you'll never see it spelled except in very very old books. You'll see chin d. Okay, that. Da is called a hard da, which means it sounds like da. Okay? So you don't put chin do after it, you put chin to. Okay? So you'll see something like. I, I think this is a good example of this country. Okay? You might see in the ancient language. I'm not sure if chin is. I'm not actually sure this has a secondary suffix, but let's just say theoretically, okay? Because they're gone, and you only see them if somebody knows and they put the right thing after them. Uh, so this chin to means gone. Okay, so I believe that has a second suffix to. I'm not sure. Okay. Anyway, that's why sometimes you'll get a to where you thought you should have got a no. Okay, it should have been chin no maybe. But there's this missing letter between this da, which is called a tech, and the na, which is that old secondary suffix da. It got hard da ta and became to like chin to. So he says that's the first exception. Hang on, Rob. Rob. What you get, you get in your mind? <laughs> By the way, the example he gives in his book, which is probably correct, <clears throat> is Jurto, past tense of to become. Okay? On the, on the understanding that there was an ancient secondary dog, see what I mean? Which dropped out of the language. Nowadays, you don't see many authors respecting that, they'll say, no. Okay. But if you see Kirtan, you know why it's there. Okay. Uh, let me spell this. So that would be became, period. Kirtan. Okay. It's good to learn it with the terminative particles, how they attach, because then it applies to other particles as well. The same rules. Okay. Mm. This is an example that might be confusing for you. Uh, this is the word ka. It's basically spelled ma ta ta means M-T-A, 
right? And on the end is silent, so it's you just read the center letter, which is ta. And then that suffix letter, a, ah, happens to be silent also. It has no effect on the sound of the word. You can learn that from the other video. Okay? It's just there for orthographic purposes, spelling purposes. Okay? Anyway, what happens when you want to end this thing? You see, what happens when you want to make a turnative here? You just put a nod over here. And you get ta. And that means the final end, essentially. Okay, tower. Okay, erase that. Um, hang on, I'm sorry. Okay. By the way, I'm going to write all the talks you saw. It just occurred to me in one of the video. Okay. Uh, oh. 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 Of course, they're just stuck up to the word. If the word ends in ka, it say rikko. If you say, if it ends in na, like songo, uh, it ends in da, like reto. It ends in na, like lino. It ends in ba, like rapo. Uh, Lamo, tawo. Okay, like that. Right? Same thing. Okay, okay. Okay, next is maybe the most important part of Tibetan grammar. Say Laden. 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 Laden means the, the particles that have the meaning of la. Okay? And la is only one of them. Uh, there are seven different la dens. Uh, you can think of them as two in English. You know, like I went to the store. So two would be an example of a la den, Okay, In English, we call them prepositions. Prepositions. I went to the store because it comes before store. Okay, I went to the store. Now, in uh, Technically, in Tibetan, they're postpositions. They come after the word they apply to. So you got to remember that. Okay? In Tibetan, they'd say, I store two going, or something like that. Okay? I store going. That's why, also the same in Hindi or, or Kanata or anything like that. That's why they say, I store going. You uh, are America going. Okay? Like that. So Ladin is, a, is like Tio, to, to, to the store. And it comes after the word store into Tibetan. You say store, and then you say to, and then you say going. Okay. All right. I'm going to write out for you the seven uh, labyrinths, which are next in your text. Suru labyrinth na labtu.
Sesuru, suru, radu, radu, nala, tu, tu. These are seven versions. They all mean the same thing. Okay, basically they all mean the same thing. They are just used in different places, as we saw with determinative particles, like como dono como ono dos o to. These are just used in different places, and sometimes they have slightly different meanings, but basically they all mean the same thing. Okay. Um, <coughs> these things apply to five different situations, okay? Five different situations. Uh, those situations are called uh, basically numbing. By the way, if you, if you don't know the letters or you don't know the pronunciation, get the other video, okay? I'm not going to go into it uh, in this club. The other video is complete, meaning uh, in three or four lessons you can learn how to pronounce anything perfectly. Okay? But I, it would be superfluous for me to do that here with limited time. So, go get the other video. Say Namie. 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 Namie means grammar case. Okay? In Sanskrit, there were eight. So Tumi Sambona came back and said, we got to have eight. Now, it's a little bit forced in Tibet, OK? Uh, I'm, and I'm going to go through some of the grammar cases with you, OK? The labdun that you just studied, that postposition, basically that preposition, applies to three of the grammar cases. Now, in Sanskrit, when you study Sanskrit, you've got to do, for example, if you had uh, what you have here, which is uh, second fourth and seventh grammar cases would be accusative, dative, and locative. <coughs> accusative, dative, and locative. Now I'll explain to you what those are, okay? Even in English grammar, okay? <laughs> anyway, in Sanskrit you have a different form for accusative singular, accusative plural, and accusative dual, meaning us two went to the store would be us, you know, to the two stores would be one ending. To the one store would be a different ending. To the three or more stores would be yet another ending. So in Sanskrit, you'd have uh, nine different endings to indicate uh, these, these three grammar cases that I'm going to talk about now. You have nine. In Tibetan, you have one. Okay. I mean, that gives you a feeling for what Tibetan's about. Also in tenses, I mean, Tibetan normally works on two, maybe three verb tenses, possibly four in weird cases. Sanskrit you get 64 uh, verb endings some things. You know what I mean? It's, it's very precise and it's, a, it's very difficult to learn because then you've got male, female, neuter, nouns, uh, which you don't have in Tibetan. So actually in, 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 in Sanskrit you might have three times nine, uh, 27 particles, 27 different endings. More actually, because uh, then you've got variations. Uh, where in Tibetan you have one. One more. So um, it's a lot easier. By the way, Sanskrit is much more precise. There's no oral uh, lineage for teaching Buddhism in Sanskrit that I'm aware of right now. You know, speaking in Sanskrit, debating in Sanskrit. Uh, and there's only very few Sanskrit texts left uh, from the original. I've heard some people say 5%. The most I've ever heard is 40% uh, of, of the scriptures left, but I, I don't. You know, what I mean is, uh, Sanskrit is very useful, very important to learn. All Buddhists speak Sanskrit right after the end uh, But the investment, I'm not sure it's worth it, if you have a great Lama like Vishnu Tukhavinche, and you just can learn to speak Tibetan in six months or 12 months, and, you know, read. You know, you can learn all the grammar endings today in an hour. Uh, Sanskrit, you know, we did it for five years, and when I was in university, you know, we still didn't finish. So, uh, anyway, I'm going to show you how those law dunes, those law, those law particles, <coughs> apply to three grammar cases and also to two other special cases. Okay.
So, so you have to match, okay? I'm trying to talk soon. Okay. Okay. If you don't remember how to spell something, you're sending someone a letter, and you don't remember if it had a secondary suffix, you just try to remember which logic people stuck on it. You know, like, Yong Su Drupa must end with a sun. See what I mean? Then you know how to spell it. By the way, spelling is a whole world in Tibet. Nobody knows how to spell. Very, very few people know how to spell. There's no requirement in a Google monastery for writing, learning to write. Uh, you do everything by debate. Um, so like in Tibet, in Gyeron Kamten, uh, out of 500 monks, I think there were two who knew how to write. Uh, and there were many Thoropa Geshes. See what I mean? And it, just, it, was, it was not normal. It was unusual for a person to master writing. Okay? You had to kind of do it on your own if you decided to do it. Okay, now we're going to talk about the second, sorry, the fourth grammar case, which is dated. Chidja uh, means the, the one for whom the action was done. Chidja means the one for whom the action was done. In English, we call it the indirect object. Okay? I gave the book to John, and John is the indirect object. Okay? It's for John's benefit that the book was given. And data that gives you that feeling of dot, dot, you know, to give in Latin, right? to give. So, Chidjao is to, for, this, for, whose, for whose sake the action is undertaken. And then, in the ancient grammar books, you might see Rakti Jimba. Rakti Jimba means perfect giving, or, you know, really giving something. That's almost the same as day to. See what I mean? Day to. Uh, it just means to whom you give this thing. Okay? And the, the example given in the scripture here. Oh, wait, wait. Sorry. I'm sorry. I keep telling him to do it, and you keep telling him to do it.
Satan, Okay, the first word happens to be ta. Ta, ta means horse. Okay? And then the, the word to, meaning to the horse, the la. The la was here written as ra. Okay? Suru da do do, right? You have seven choices how to write it. It happens to be that on an open, what we call an open syllable, meaning there's an open vowel. There's no suffix letter, there's no secondary suffix letter. It's just ta, or ka, or ma, or mo, or mi. It ends in a vowel sound. You can just stick a ra right onto it. Okay? Ta means to the horse. Okay? In English, it'd be horse to. Okay? To the horse. Ta, he's showing off, I think, just to get you. I'm sorry, I've missed your words. Sorry. Uh, he's showing off uh, a very difficult stack of letters. Uh, ta means uh, grass. If you write it with what we call a basura, and uh, you can learn about that in the first video, okay? If you don't know about wasser. <laughs> jin is the past tense of the word jin, which we just had to give. So I gave horse, I'm uh, sorry, I gave grass to the horse. <laughs> and the horse uh, is, is in the dative case. Chetaja means the grass was benefiting the horse. It was the horse who got the benefit from the grass, okay? In English, again, we say indirect object. I gave the book to John. Sarame has a dukan, the main temple. 
Uh, if you've got to go to the Sojo with Sarah May and Sarah Jane Monk, you go to the Sopchen, which is the big big temple for both Sarahs. And then this would be called like a Ha Kang or, or something like that. Like this would be Jot Sang, sorry, Kam Tin Du Kang or Kam Tin Ha Kang, meaning a small chapel on both sides. It means a deity house. Okay, Ha Kang. Uh, Hong Kong 2, here's the La Dun, okay? Here's the post position. Su Na, Su Na Du Na Du, okay? In the, in the chapel, okay, in the chapel, there is Yuk, okay? There is, which is Yuk, a Den Su. Den Su is abbreviation for Ku Sung Tuk Den Su, okay? Ku Sung Tuk Den. Ku uh, Sung Tuk Den means uh, a place where the body, speech, and mind have landed. Okay, and that's the Tibetan word for a, an altar. This is a gusun tukten. Okay, this is a tensun, meaning a, a place where the representations of the Buddhist body, speech, and mind have, have now been landed or, or are there. <coughs> Got it? So that's the locative. That shows where the altar uh, exists. It exists in the in the chapel. Okay, there's a the altar is in the chapel. Okay. 
Got it? Mm, yes. All right. So we said there were five applications <coughs> of the proposed position of the logger. And so far you have three grammar cases, and you have one special case of the second grammar case. Now we have a special case of the seventh grammar case. Okay. Um, 
it was so common to say so claimed, meaning that school claims, period, that, that Rho became a, a code word for the terminative particle began to be used for statements you don't believe yourself. Okay, so in the Abhidharma Kosha, Master Vasubandhu, in his Sanskrit, and then translated to Tibetan, you constantly say, you see exactly, especially in the first two chapters, say, that he'll be saying, uh, you know, meaning, hey, that's what the Abhidharma schools say. Okay, so it's really just a terminative particle, but it indicates disfavor with the position he's just stated. Because he's, uh, you know, a higher school guy who's just writing this uh, Abhidharma Kosha out for other people's benefit. He's, he's reporting, as he says in the last chapter, the beliefs of these Kashmiri uh, philosophers that he doesn't believe. Now, unfortunately, you don't know when he's using it as a terminative particle, and you don't know when he's using it as a particle of disfavor. So, it, the, the ex translating that becomes very interesting. Okay? You have to be very careful. And now back to the postposition. Okay. Where do you put postpositions? Uh, here's the rules. It starts out, what's it say? Sasu, right? Let me get his examples out. change the A to A, which that's in the first video, okay? Yeah. This happens to end in Sa. So when you say to the right, Ye means right hand, the right side. You say Ye Su, meaning to the right side. So when the syllable ends in Sa, and you want to say second grammar case, fourth grammar case, seventh mm -hmm. grammar case, or special case of the second grammar case, or special case of the seventh grammar case, mm -hmm. then you stick on Su. Okay, got it? By the way, La is multi-purpose. You can always say La. If you don't remember these rules, just put la. <laughs> yeah, la. Okay? That's legal. In colloquial, we don't say yesu very much. It's yela. We just use la. Okay? La is a generic postposition. You can use it everywhere. Okay? Okay, wait. What's the next thing say? Ka pa ta ta tu. Which means, when you have a ka, or a ba, or some kind of ta, meaning ta ta, meaning a hard da, meaning the secondary da suffix, right? That we talked about before. You can go back to the video and check it out. Uh, then you say tu, and I'll give you some examples, okay?
And I'm not going to give you the other examples. If the, if the syllable ended in pa, you'd also use tu. Here's another example. Three, four percent of the cases do is the beginning of a new word, like Duma. 
or to wow, okay? Something like that. Same word for in, at, on, through, towards, around, when, uh, 
you know, all, and, and maybe 20 other words, okay? And you just have to, you have to know. You have to get the meaning of it first, and then you, you work backwards and, and find the best English word. What I'm trying to say is that, as a goal in translation, translating Tibetan, you have to grok the meaning and use the correct English preposition. If you sit there and see la and go through 20 things it could mean and try